All right. Okay. Yes, yeah, but I think. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, we're in for a treat today. So. <laughs> uh, uh, I know. <laughs> um, so um, Candace is our speaker. I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Um, I want to mention that on Sunday, uh, the 17th, William Moyes Weaver is going to be speaking on heirloom vegetable gardening and bringing some of his heirloom vegetable varieties and several of his books. He is uh, a nationally known um, heirloom vegetable specialist and a uh, food historian. The cost for that program is $5, um, but you are certainly welcome to attend. Um, please register beforehand if you can. So um, without further ado, we'll get on to lunch and treats. Okay, <laughs> sort of, sort of treats. <laughs> okay, everyone, let me get myself organized here. Because I unfortunately have to sit. Okay, are we, we're ready to go, Beth? Okay. Okay, there we have it. So my little program is entitled Fosnox and Fish Fridays, Eating Our Way from Carnival to Lent. And um, here you see a picture that I will be discussing quite a bit um, during the early part of this presentation. Um, on to the next. So, oh, oh, okay. Oh, thank you. oh, we're going to get our blinds drawn a bit more closed. Yeah, that's true. Is that better? The lights off. Oh, yeah, the lights need to come down further. Sorry about that. No, they're not. Unless they're off, that's the one straight up. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I like to do with a lot of these programs is first look at the etymology of the words that are involved. And in this case, the words are carnival and Lent. Um, carnivale, which is the Italian, meaning Shrove Tuesday, which is from older Italian forms, which means caro, meaning flesh, and lavare, to put off, put away, or remove. So it's putting away the flesh. Um, meaning what's going to happen after carnival. Um, and it, some scholars say that it doesn't just mean putting aside the meat, which is what you'd assume because one abstains from meat during Lent traditionally. It's abstaining from all things fleshy, if you get my drift, as it were. <laughs> it is not just the meat. It is anything that um, is, is decadent, decadent behavior. So Lent then is from an old English word that actually means springtime and, and from a West Germanic word that means the lengthening of day. So, and specifically that's what we just experienced but by artificial means, of course, that our days have been lengthened. So first of all, I wanna discuss this picture, which is by Peter Bruegel, and it's a very, very famous picture, the fight between Carnival and Lent, that's owned by the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. So what this, this um, the main focus of this picture, it's not in the center ground, as one might expect, but it's down here at the bottom of the picture, which shows on the left, a man riding a barrel with a, um, a, 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 a spear of meat, jousting with a, a nun figure or some kind of clerical figure with a peel from a bake oven that he or she, it's supposed. I think it's supposed to be a female, is jousting with. Um, and they're each followed by their own groups of supporters. So the Bacchanalian people are following the big guy who looks like a Bacchus type character on the barrel, while there's religious folk 
following the the nun figure. And interestingly, there's bread and pretzels on the little cart that the nun figure is sitting on. So this picture uh, was made in 1559, which is important because that is during the period of what important movement in our society, European society. The Reformation, it occurred, this painting was painted during the Reformation and really shows um, a the sort of the clash between the traditional Catholic Church and the Lenten ways, which were very austere, and um, the more um, robust and Bacchanalian ways of the, the new Protestantism, or that that's what they're implying. And of course, this was a Dutch or Flemish painting, so there was a whole different Protestant um, background to this than there would have been Catholic. So there are many um, views like this. And this is, if you can Google this picture, I should say, um, you wanna really look at it closely because there's so much going on in this picture. It's, it's a marvelous, marvelous masterpiece. But here we have another one that's a little more obvious by um, a follow of, follower of Hero Heronius Bosch, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that correctly today, which shows these clerical figures once again fighting. It almost looks like they're dancing, but I think they're supposed to be fighting with um, secular figures in this picture, also from the post-Reformation era. And then here, this one's really fabulous. They're really going at it in this one with the clerical people on the right. And if you look at that man, it's hard to see, but there's a man in black with a black um, cap on, and he is holding um, several dried fish <laughs> in his hand, and he's going to beat people with this fistful of dried fish. And um, you see all the, the guys, the secular guys on the left who are carrying all kinds of different, different implements, including a spit with some kind of fowl on it. And back in the way back, there's a fellow holding a waffle iron, which not, <laughs> which not only is a good um, weapon, if you hit somebody with it hard enough, but it also makes a lot of noise if you go clack, clack, clack. Um, and then also making waffles and pancakes were definitely a, a Fat Tuesday, a fast not type practice. So here's a little character here, uh, once again with the waffle iron. That waffle iron was an important symbol, particularly if you're talking about Dutch or Flemish pictures or possibly French. The waffle, it was such an important part of their culinary culture. So here, this character is holding the waffle iron again. So this is what happened before the fast. And of course, the fast, the, um, the feasting before the fast went by many names. Fasnacht, Fasching, Carnival, Carnival, Shrovetide, and Mardi Gras. <laughs> so we, Pennsylvania Dutch, as you probably know, are not the only ones with a fried dough tradition. Um, fried dough was the staple of, of Carnival and Fasnacht. Um, because it was the way of using up all your good ingredients by Lent, before Lent. So that was using your fats, your butter, anything you had on hand um, in that you needed to use up before Lent so it wouldn't be there to tempt you. You had to get rid of it. So these are all the different varieties. Some are more like Fosnox. The one on those on the left are all unfilled fried dough. Um, Niekugle, I hope I'm saying that right, I probably am not, is um, that that's a kneecap. <laughs> it's named for your knee. Those were German, of course. The Zeppeli di Carnival were the fried dough of um, the Italians. And I should point out that these all are regional names. There are many other names for most of these things, but they're all very similar. 
Um, they also make a Zapole in um, for St. Joseph's Day, which is a little bit better known, but St. Joseph's Day falls during Lent. So I've left that one off. Beignet, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. The, the Spanish one, um, if I have a Spanish speaker who would like to take a jab at that, I wouldn't mind. No, Jim, you can do it, Jim. Benuelos de Vienta. Okay, yeah, so that's the Spanish version, and that looks very fast, not S. Um, and the mas Malasada, which is Portuguese. Then on the right-hand side, we have the filled fried dough, which is Kropfen, which is the German entry, um, Ponchki, which is the Polish, which we find very um, regularly around here in grocery stores. I know that Redner's often sells them this time of year. Has anyone ever bought mass produced ones from the grocery store? I think they always look very delicious, so I try to avoid them. Uh, <laughs> Semlor, which are the Swedish version, and apparently uh, one of the Swedish kings ate too many of these and it killed them, killed him. So they were outlawed for a time in Sweden. <laughs> How dare they? The greedy king. Um, the Fratelli di Carnavale, which is of course Italian the, um, and filled with custard. And then on the, the lower one, which is the Hawaiian Malasada, um, the, the Portuguese traders who were going to Hawaii brought this tradition of fried dough with them, but the Hawaiians took it up, took it up a notch and made it a filled donut, often with um, Hawaiian ingredients, whether they be coconut or other kinds of tropical fruits. It sounds divine. Makes you want to get on a plane just for that. <laughs> But that these, these, um, and, and like I said, this is just really the tip of the iceberg. There are tons of regionalisms. There are also other things that are just like fried dough strips that occur across many different European cultures. And um, a lot of these things actually made their way probably from Asia um, and the Middle East into Europe. And, and that's how they ended up there. But uh, a wonderful kind of food culture that we don't think about. Oops, let me, I'm sorry, I have to go back. Where do funnel cakes from? Uh, <laughs> well, I think, yeah, it is a good question. And that probably has a similar history. It's just the making with the funnel. And actually that's in other cultures too. It's not confined to the Pennsylvania Germans or Germans. There seems to be a greater funnel cake tradition. And even um, they, some Native American groups have tried to, or tried to introduce fried bread, which is a wonderful Native American treat from the Western tribes into the culture um, as a, as for, for Fasnacht or Carnival. So these are the earliest um, recipes, apparently for Kropfen, which are from 1439 and from 1485. And so here's um, one to prepare good fritters when you fast. So it's nuts and pound them in a mortar and take as many apples and cut them into cubes. Mix them well with spices, whichever kind they be, and fill them into the fritters, the kropfen. Lay them into the pan and let them fry. So all of these things, they, they used acceptable Lenten ingredients, except perhaps the frying aspect of it. So the, this, when rules relaxed, actually, I'll talk about that a little later. The Lenten rules did not continue in the strictest sense um, into the later medieval and early modern period. So you might have been able to fry something legitimately that was still made with ingredients that were also acceptable, the nuts and the apples and, and the spices, which were all would have all been acceptable Lenten foods. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Fasnax and the interesting culture that surrounds them. Um, the, the photo on the less, left is of a ball that took place, I believe, in, in the northeastern part of the state. 
um, in February of 1882. So they were holding balls, not unlike they would have held for Mardi Gras, but instead for Fasnacht, um, Fasnacht Dienstag, it says, Fasnacht Tuesday. Um, and then people often held Fasnacht parties where they served um, Fasnachts. And in this case, this one on the right, in Lancaster County was held by a Miss Amelia Fosnock. So she had <laughs> all her bases come, didn't she? <laughs> and these were common. These are just two examples that I found very interesting. They're early, of course, 1882. And then the Amelia's party was from the turn of the 20th century. Oops, I'm sorry. Why do I do that? And then all kinds of poetry, the wise and otherwise is something all of us Pennsylvanians can relate to. Today is donut day. And if the woman folks who are baking the goodies have a little bit of civic pride about them, let them take the holes out of our city streets and place them in the donuts. And that would, would assure a supply that there'd be enough donuts for all. So, <laughs> and we can all relate to the potholes, can't we? Um, and then this is a little bit of uh, poetry about Donut Day. There's everyone waxed rhapsodic about different foods back in the day. Donut Day, how well I know it, years ago down on the farm, how they sizzled in the suet held me spellbound as a charm. How impatiently I waited, prone to sink my teeth in one till the temperature abated and Aunt Kate pronounced them done. Big and brownish, rich and mellow, whole of regulation size, nothing else to please a fellow not so fair to youthful eyes. One a relish, two delicious, three a banquet spread for one. Children all grew avaricious. That's a really good rhyme, isn't it? Exactly. Ere the donut day was done. <laughs> so the, all the, I, I just find this very interesting. And, and in Allentown, there was actually a company um, called, uh, does anybody remember this? They, they, they were called the Fosnock Company. Um, and they specialized in making Fosnock, supposedly. And they even had delivery trucks. Um, in Philadelphia on on Fasnacht or um, Carnival Day, they often promoted Donut Day, as it was better known among the English speakers, um, as uh, that um, uh, for selling Fasnachts, even in Philadelphia. And um, the um, picture on the right is more recent, but I was interested to see that the Morning Call was having a promotion with Weiss and you could actually get a free donut. That would not happen in 2024 anymore, so. Happy Moe Counting Calories Day. Yeah, yeah, happy no Counting Calories Day. Happy, don't forget the, what does it say? The, the, molasses. the molasses day, yes. But I have never felt that Weiss sold real Fosnock, so I don't know, does anybody else? feel that way. I've always yeah. felt they were false Foss knocks. Yeah. False knocks. <laughs> false knocks. False knocks. <laughs> and I have two more things. I'm I'm I like to read things, so I apologize for that. But I have two things related to Foss knocks because there's a lot of Foss knock lore out there. Um so first one from 1881 among the French this day was called Mardi Gras Fat Tuesday and among English speaking people Pancake Day. In England, it was customary after the confession of sins to dine on pancakes and fritters, and the people afterwards gave themselves up to merrymaking. In Germany, the day is called Fasnacht, Fast Night, and it is still customary among the Pennsylvania Germans to bake light cakes. Oh, yeah, okay. On this day called Fasnachkuchen. This last is to get up in the morning of this day is reproachfully, the last to get up on the morning of this day is reproachfully reproachfully called Fasna. The sturdy farmer among the Pennsylvania Germans believed that if he neglects to eat a Fasna Kuchen on this day, he will have a poor crop of flax the next season and the housewife who has failed to bake them may expect their, her kitchen to be under, overrun with roaches. <laughs> and then here's another one. I like I like my Fosnox with a side of vermin. Uh, a raid on donuts. 
these Dutch indigestibles called donuts, but better known in this immediate locality, this is from Lancaster, this article, as Fasnachts are still popular as a breakfast and tea cake among the descendants of our German ancestors. But it seems that there are other animals besides man who have an affection for them. For instance, on Saturday afternoon last, the family of Mr. Elias Barr in South Lime Street had prepared something over a hundred of these cakes, which were placed in the cellar to be kept until wanted. When they were wanted, however, they were not there. To be classic, they were non-est. An investigation established the fact that between Saturday night and Sunday morning, a raid had been made upon them by a band of rats who carried off every cake, not leaving a crumb behind. In pursuing the investigation further, it was found that the rats had stored their booty in an old cupboard at a next door neighbor's. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's... This cupboard was some, seldom used and it was just by chance that it happened to be opened on Sunday morning when the discovery was made that the rats had selected it as a storehouse for their ill-gotten goods. The cakes were dragged through a sort of underground railroad, and their appearance indicated that they had received rough usage in transit. It is a curious case, and there could be no doubt as to the facts stated. <laughs> don't leave the don't leave your fast knocks out. That's the moral of that tale. Okay, so we mentioned I mentioned in that one reading. This day, um, which Pancake Day, which is Shrove Tuesday in Great Britain with this wonderful painting. I love these genre paintings from the Netherlands and, and the Flemish paintings. They're so amazing. Um, but this is a boy holding up a pancake mask. So Shrove Tuesday um, means a day of atonement that would be the Day of Atonement. And in this case, the Day of Atonement prior to Lent. But there are all kinds of marvelous traditions that accompanied Pancake Day in Great Britain. Um, one of them was the ringing of the pancake bell. I will not read this whole thing, but this is from a play called The Shoemaker's Holiday, which was written and, well, first performed in 1599, so written sometime before that, uh, written by Thomas Decker. Um, so the company says, the pancake bell rings, the pancake bell, trillil my hearts, oh brave, oh sweet bell, oh delicate pancakes, open the doors, my hearts, and shut up the windows, keep in the house, let out the pancakes, oh rare, my hearts, let's march together for the honor of St. Hugh to the new hall in Gracious Street Corner, which our master, the new Lord Mayor, hath built." Um, so, and then the last par paragraph reads, O musical bell still, O hodge, O my brethren, there's cheer for the heavens, venison pasties walk up and down, piping hot like sergeants, beef and brewis comes marching in dry fats, fritters and pancakes comes trolling along in real barrows, lemons and oranges hopping in porter's baskets, collops and eggs and scuttles, and tuts and car tarts and cus custards come quavering in malt shovels. So that was the a feast that would occur on pancake day with the pancakes. And here is an image. This was another tradition. There were many little traditions depending on where you lived in England uh, about pancake day. And this one was at a specific school in Westminster where the cook would come out and see how high he could flip the pancake, throwing the pancake. <laughs> and another one, um, this was very similar to other practices like uh, Calathumpian bands. When I say Calathumpian bands or Dutch bands, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, it's um, a marriage tradition or a wedding tradition here specifically in Pennsylvania Dutch country where the, a newly married couple would be harassed with a group of generally young men who would bring um, pots and pans and make all kinds of noisemakers, um, all kinds of things to harass them on their wedding night. And this is sort of a similar thing that involves young boys harassing people who would not give them treats on pancake day. <laughs> And, and it was called going a shroving. He says, the second one is, 
I become a shroving for a little pancake, a little, a bit of bread or your bacon or a little truckle cheese or your man making. If you give me a little, I'll ask no more. If you don't give me nothing, I'll rattle your door. And, but rattling your door was throwing broken crockery at your door. <laughs> So very much, or, or like belt sniffling, you know, it's a very, this similar thing of mobs of young men, on this case, supposedly little boys harassing um, the neighborhood to get a treat. And then this character, who was known as jack o -Lent, who showed up during Shrove Tuesday and through Lent, which they say was a character that was supposed to represent um, Judas Iscariot. So you, they would, this character looks like a, a human being, but it would usually be some kind of a scarecrow like object that would be set up in the village square that the locals would then take turns throwing probably crockery and rocks and whatever at, um, because they, that he was symbolizing Judas who would have betrayed Christ. Um, and this poem is when Jack Alent comes jostling in with the headpiece of a herring. Well, this one doesn't have a herring. And say, repent you of your sin for shame, sirs, leave your swearing. And to Palm Sunday doth he ride with sprouts and herrings by his side. Well, he does have some herrings by his side. And makes an end of Lenten tide. So so this, this character would continue from... Um, Fat Tuesday Carnival and through Lent for the British, and supposedly goes on today in some places. They have th there are so many fascinating customs relating to the folk culture that are very ancient in England. Um, I'm sure you've heard of some of them, but I, I I'm always fascinated and glad when I can research them. And then this, of course, we all know about Mardi Gras in New Orleans. But this is one of the sort of precursors to the bigger Mardi Gras tradition, which was Le Bouf Gras, which was the leading of a fatted calf, essentially, through the streets during Lent, um, or not during Lent, during, during Mardi Gras, during Fasnacht, um, to indicate this would be the last feast before Lent. So these sort of Bacchanalian figures. And here's another one. This was a very popular um, uh, uh, subject for painters. This one is, is Dutch, um, also leaving, leading the fatted calf with a procession through the streets. And then this is one that took place here in New Orleans or, or um, Baton Rouge or one of the other Louisiana towns um, with what we would think of very traditional Mardi Gras costumes. Um, this tradition sort of faded away at the end of the 20th century because they felt that this, um, uh, not the end of the, the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, because they felt that there were more uh, wonderful and beautiful things they could do and not just lead a cow through the streets. Um, so the poor cow, well, maybe the cow was glad to be put away. And then they, they did revive it and created a, a paper mache cow, which they might still use today. Some of the crews in Mardi Gras still might use the paper mache cow, and certainly in France and other countries that celebrate Mardi Gras. Okay, now we'll move on to Lent. So here's a wonderful little image of um, the skeletons serving nuns at Lent, and the the <laughs> the nuns are getting fish, which is would be perfectly normal. Um, so by the, from the early church, uh, the only Lenten foods really ordained by the early Christian church were vegetables, bread, and salt which in reality was probably the typical diet of any peasant, really. If they had access to any other meat, even be it fish, uh, something of the flesh, that was probably very special. Um, and if you were an Orthodox Christian, you couldn't eat anything with a backbone during Lent. So that would include fish and another little fellow we'll talk about in a minute. So there was this combination of 
fasting versus abstinence, where fasting might allow you to eat or might tell you to eat nothing at all. Or if you were a working person, you might be able to eat one small meal a day, a very small meal for the fasting aspect. And the abstinence, of course, was abstaining from um, meat, eggs, butter, anything that was milk, anything that was derived from an animal. And um, of course, um, intoxicating beverages, basically anything that was delicious. But <laughs> if you think about it, really, the peasants had terrible diets. You know, they, they really didn't have anything to eat. So they might have had a porridge of, of vegetables and maybe a little bread. So this was probably not highly unusual for them, this diet at all. It was probably perfectly normal. Um, it was for other people that it wasn't normal. Um, the, um, the better off, the aristocrats, the higher ups in the church who, were, who indulged a lot. Um, but here is a little bit of um, <laughs> things that you could eat during Lent, if you could get your hands on them. Uh, we'll start with the one on the left, and, and that would be um, a, a snail. Uh, snails were acceptable to eat, and they would have been acceptable also to Orthodox Christians because they were just a mollusk. Um, uh, we'll go up to the upper right-hand corner, eels, which we were eating. Yes, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> My personal story, I always have to interject my personal story of eels. When I was about 10 years old, I went to camp on the Shawnee on the Delaware and we swam in the Delaware River. And one day I'm in the in the river and this terrible stinking mess comes floating by me and it was a dead eel. And I have never forgotten that nor forgiven the eel because it's disgust. It was disgusting. <laughs> But they loved eels and eels were often, uh, eels were so plentiful. Um, they set up eel traps and streams in that little picture. That's what the man in the stream is doing. He's, he's got an eel trap in the screen, stream and in Britain. This is most likely a British image. And then eels were often used to pay, um, to pay monasteries to pay tax to monasteries because the, the, the monks really ate, needed to eat the eels. That was part of their diets because of the, um, the abstinence and the, um, the fasting. Uh, of course, oysters, which is a normal thing to eat, but certainly not beloved of everyone, uh, but popular for Lent. And then the guy in the middle, what is that guy in the middle? Do you know, can you tell what he is? Actually, the Latin word, if you can read it, kind of gives it away, but but the Latin word is castorium. Does that help anybody? Um, but look at his tail. He's a beaver. Beavers in the Middle Ages were considered fish. So you could eat eat his tail, I guess. It's the, the idea is revolting, but <laughs> I, I, maybe it was tasty. Maybe they were, they were delight. Has anyone ever had beaver meat? I know well, there are lots of other critters, but I, I don't know. There's something about eating a beaver that seems very wrong, um, <laughs> but that was, that was one of the um, favored, favored foods. <laughs> Backbones? No, they do have backbones for sure. But this was a non-orthodox people. Only orthodox people couldn't have the backbones. I think they could only eat the tail. And you see on the on the picture, if you look very carefully, he has a um a forked tail or a you know like a fish would have. He, so so even though beavers don't have forked tails, they're indicating that he's. You, this is like fish, so you can eat this. There's a TV show on that they hunt and they eat the beaver, and the tail is a delicacy. Oh, um, <laughs> Mountain Men, Mountain Men, a show on um, 
one of the channels where they they consider beaver eating the beaver a delis uh eating the beaver but eating the tail is a delicacy so i guess if you were lucky enough to get a beaver then you, then you were lucky but um you know a, a lot of these animals too you just didn't have you know that you just if you were a peasant living in 13 to 1400 you did not have run of the um the the woods or the properties because it was all owned by some feudal lord so hunting in was really off limits to most people unless you were poaching so somehow if you were lucky enough to get any of these things you were you were just lucky because you wouldn't have them because they were all made destined for somebody else's table not your poor peasant table I'm thinking of that for, I don't know, I think it's from a Mel Brooks movie where somebody says the people are revolting or, you know, <laughs> they were revolting in more ways than one. <laughs> and then here's my favorite topic, pretzels, the perfect Lenten food. They truly are the perfect Lenten food because if you make pretzels in a classical manner, they are three ingredients, uh, flour, water and salt yep so that that is the perfect lenten food it doesn't offend anyone um and here you this is a, a image from the morgan library and i hope you can see it but at the last supper um there's pretzels on the table and actually christ is feeding judas who is the character in the front um, a half of a pretzel. So I don't know if he's trying to choke him or what, but it, <laughs> but it, it's a very strange image, isn't it? Where he's trying to feed him this pretzel. Um, and monks commonly sold pretzels through their bakeries. And there's this um, tradition that they were also given away pretzels to the poor and indigent, specifically during Lent, but possibly other times also because it was such an excellent food for um, Lent. But they, so many times this was something coming out of the monasteries. They are, um, these were soft pretzels though, remember that. When I'm talking about pretzels, they were always soft pretzels. And I'm happy to say at the end of the program, we're going to have several treats set up for you in the back. So I'm sorry that we didn't warn you ahead of time, but we wanted it to be a surprise. So, but you can take your serving at home with you if you'd like, but we have soft pretzels back there. And then we also have, oops, sorry about that. Quick question on the last. Slide. Oh yeah, hold on. Um, yeah, go ahead. You mentioned about uh, Jesus feeding Judas the pretzel. It almost to me looks like that's in substitute of the host. Oh, you're right. You know, right? Good point. Like I didn't think of that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. In substitute of the host, feeding feeding the pretzel in substitute of the host, if you didn't hear that. Um, okay. So here is something else you're going to get to try today, which is Simnel Cake from um, Great Britain for Mothering Sunday which was, I believe, supposed to be the fourth Sunday in Lent. It wasn't Mother's Day. It was called Mothering Sunday. And it was a day when the children who were out, out of the house working, whether in the great houses, you know, because the great houses of Britain took so much labor. They were out working, but they were given a vacation day on this Sunday to come home and one of the treats they often brought their mother would have been this simnel cake. Simnel is a word that sort of translates into um, uh, uh, the best flour or the best bread, something, something to that effect. Um, so on the left, we have a Simnel cake from 1869 that has sort of a crenellated top to it like a, um, a, a castle. And then um, on the on the lower right, we have one with marzipan balls with the 11 apostles. Now, why 11 apostles? What? Because of Judas, right? <laughs> Thank you. I just want every, um, which were made of marzipan. 
So, so that would have also been a fairly late addition because marzipan was not used in the Middle Ages, of course, pro unless by very wealthy people. Uh, so this tradition um, of, of this cake dates back into the Middle Ages, but was really carried on in the 19th, 18th and 19th century when all these great houses were being built and had all these staffs of these people who would want to visit their mother at some time before Easter. Okay. Yes. Uh, quite a statement. My church up in New York practiced mothering Sunday. We were, were, we were told it was people returned home for the mother church. Oh, and yes, and that too. And the mother church obviously would be here 90% of the time. The family had to move, so they visited their mother. Nan, thanks for pointing that out. Nan said that it was also returning to your mother church, and that is actually very true. That's a, another, there's, yeah, two two aspects of it is your mother church and your 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 own mother. Um, yes, so, so that's what the people were returning to on that Lenten day. Uh, what church did you attend, an Episcopal or a, yeah, that would make sense then. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That would make sense. Anybody else have a comment there? Okay. Okay, so that's my little play on words um, with a, a picture of um, St. Benedict uh, feeding his monks from the early 16th century. Uh, St. Benedict was one of the toughest guys with the rules. So um, these, these rules, which were not meant to be broken, eventually were. <laughs> and in very recent history, we're going to drop, go really far ahead into the 20th century from the 18th and 19th century. But following Vatican II, Pope Paul, um, and I have that number wrong, excuse me, it's the sixth, not the fourth. <laughs> he, um, he relaxed the rules. So, so you no longer had to eat fish every Friday. Uh, that was uh, something that was really ingrained in the um, in the Catholic consciousness, I guess. Do we have any people who are Catholic or were raised Catholic here? Was that true, that that was really ingrained? Yes, people are shaking their head that that was such a... It's also the Episcopal Church. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and it might have been in deference to the Catholic children, but also my mother, who was not Catholic, um, always a personal story. My mother was raised in outside of New York City, and the fish was always fresh on Friday. So I think that, and if you, you look through newspapers and so forth, you see on Fridays, it seems like that's when the fresh catch was coming in. So women were likely to go down and buy the freshest fish available, especially before refrigeration was a possibility. So I think it was, it was a practical thing as well as something that had been ordained by the church. So from a friend of mine, um, I got a typical Friday dinner, which would have worked for Lent also, um, for a South Philadelphia Italian Catholic family. And this would have been in the 60s and 70s. And these are the four things that he pointed out specifically, is macaroni. And presumably he meant what we think of as macaroni. I didn't check him on this, but um, not just pasta in general, but I'm sure that pasta in general could have also been eaten just with no meat. You weren't eating a meat sauce or meatballs or anything like that. Um, maybe clams, clam, clams and pasta, that would have been acceptable. Mussels, because they could go and get those from the corner store. Pizza without meat and stuffed artichokes, interestingly enough, because those were also vegetarian. So anything that we would today consider vegetarian was free game. But by this time, all of those rules had been relaxed about, um, about, eggs and butter and that kind of thing. Those were now acceptable. It was really the meat that wasn't the prop, that was the problem. Not all the meat products like eggs and 
eggs and butter and so forth. And oil was fine too. Now, when I was doing this research, I came across this very interesting phenomenon in Hazleton. <laughs> Is anybody here from Hazleton or near Hazleton? And have you ever heard of what they, their form of pizza, which they call pits? My, yes. My family, my father's family, uh, part of his family is from Hazel. We used to go visit Synapse. Is, uh, we used to get their pits. Yeah, their pits. Yeah. I just thought this was the funniest thing. This is all very a cultural phenomenon in Hazleton that still exists today. This is still there where it's just pizza, but it might be special Northeastern Pennsylvania pizza, which is a whole other kind of pizza. It is not um, what we necessarily eat as pizza here in suburban Philadelphia, if you think of us like that, or in New Jersey, it is a different pizza and this extends well into Northeastern Pennsylvania to wilkes barre and a place called Old Forge, if you've heard of Old Forge pizza. Um, but these, uh, these are typical pizzas that one could have during Lent if you lived in Hazleton. The most interesting thing too, to me, is the word skmutz. Uh, do we have a ta any Italians here that are familiar with that word? Scamuts is actually the um, um, Italian American word, just like mozzarella, or prosciutto, or gabagool, for uh, scamorza, which is an aged mozzarella. Now, mozzarella is generally fresh, so this is an aged mozzarella. And because I became fascinated by this, I bought some online because you cannot buy it in stores, at least not that I have found. It's not available. It might be available in a nicer store like Wegmans or De Bruno Brothers or somewhere like that. But in general grocery stores, scamorza is not available. And it does have a more aged taste than fresh, fresh mozzarella. And I asked some of my Italian um, American friends here at work, our, our volunteers, um, if they remember this, and they do remember having it here in Norristown and Philadelphia area. Um, but uh, it, it seems to have lived on and still today is quite popular in the Hazleton area, scumuts. And here I was just fascinated by the Lenten pizza um, phenomenon because you to me pizza is a treat uh, of of great proportions so to to have pizza on Lent would seem like you are getting a treat even if it is it does have all the ingredients which are appropriate to eat for Lent but I I was particularly interested in the the tuna pizza that's from Allentown which is okay tuna pizza but the fact that you are having the tuna pizza for Lent with with the go go guys and girls so <laughs> so so much for the cat putting away of the flesh if with yeah. the <laughs> but the the one in the upper left hand corner is actually from the 1940s from uh, northeastern Pennsylvania so you can see how early uh, it was. Um, it, that people were able to get pizza because in my world, in Ravazonia, Pennsylvania, we did not get pizza until about 1975 in the actual town of Ravazonia. So the fact that these other people, but uh, I know there were a lot of Italian immigrants in the Northeastern part of the state, that they were having it in the 1940s is pretty fabulous. So on that particular piece, it's a strictly Lent food, but it's got steaks. I know. <laughs> They were um, a bucket of irony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now for our next treat that you're going to experience today. So I hope you're, oops, sorry about that. I always do that. I hope you're a little hungry. We will be having this today. Have you heard of pagash or pogacha? Gotcha. Yes. One. Okay. Yes. So we're going to have some today. And this, the map shows the Pogash belt, 
<laughs> which <laughs> is basically from right below Bloomsburg, um, up past um, Tunkhannock. You know, it's that strip. So, it, and you can't really get it much beyond that. That's where it is. Pagash it was initially another type of filled pastry. Um, and it was sort of like a pierogi, but it wasn't. It was more like a bun with filling in it um, that was Eastern European, I think in many cultures, not just Polish, but possibly Hungarian also. Um, but then it evolved into an actual pizza, which is made with mashed potatoes, <laughs> onions, and cheese. Can you imagine? And you're going to get to have some today. So here is two companies um, in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. These are recent advertisements serving pagash only in Lent. And he, the, the one on the left for three guys says, we, once we are out, we are out. We can only peel so many potatoes. <laughs> and then the pagash boli, which is a stromboli, which would be more probably in keeping with the pagacha, the traditional pagacha, which was the bun, the filled bun um, that you could also get. And all of these are, like I said, from Northeastern Pennsylvania. So if you want this, I'm afraid you'll either have to make it yourself or go to Northeastern Pennsylvania during Lent. Well, I thank you so much for listening today. That's just a little tiny bit of a very complicated story. So <laughs> thank you for coming and and please enjoy our treats. The um, Sarah and Barb are getting them ready at the back table for you. Thank you. <laughs>
I've been meaning to try or something like that now. Okay. So, but I think they're they claim that they're authentic, but I, I've never had them. Happy's Orchard. Yeah. yeah. On uh, Castle Road. On Castle Row yeah. is another Foss Knot place. Somebody gets to egg and then they say they're the other side of the potato. Like, so oh. So it's yeah. Not, yeah. It's not, not mashed potato. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, some of the places make them with potato flakes, so it's not necessarily authentic because our ancestors did not have dehydrated potatoes, did they? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, oh, no. Well, thank you for coming. Oh, yes. Our neighbors across the street from us, they were from Cambridge. And I was, when I was younger, the parents would be upstairs, you know, talking, and they would buy us a pizza, and we would downstairs in the rec room, but they never called it pizza, they called it pizza. Pizza, yes. Yes, and then some of them would drop the A entirely. Yeah. But probably, I think that the story is behind the pits or the pizza, is that that's what the sign maker heard this, the guy say to him, pizza, so, and that if it was an Italian immigrant, perhaps they that was how they were pronouncing it. And that's how it became known as Pitts and Hazleton and remained Pitts on their sign. Yeah, Jim. I grew up in Norristown and in the 50s and 60s, and the forerunner of the pizza was uh, tomato pie. Yes. Formerly tomato. Yeah. Pie. And does that fit into this? Um, probably, because that would be the perfect Lenten, you know. Yeah. Just tomatoes with eat, you know, the little bit of Parmesan on it. The tomato pie that was popular and is very popular today in Norristown um, would have been definitely a, a Lenten pie. Anybody else? Well, please enjoy the treats and and I hope you saved a little room. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Thank you. Oh, my stupid legs. I'm sorry. <laughs>